I welcome you to tune in for the second panel of the day with the headline, There are no boundaries or borders in the digital age. I found one thought from the video really beautiful. We trust roads and bridges when we want to get to each other. So how can we stand in unity virtually as well? What kind of digital society we're going to live for the generations to come? Uh, in search of the collaborative spirit of the new digital age, I have a very big honor to host three extraordinary people to help me break the boundaries and the borders. So without further ado, uh, next to me I have Mr. Lucas Ilves, the Government Chief Information Officer of Estonia. Welcome. Good afternoon. And Mr. Oliver Vartno, the CEO of Cybernetica, the company that has had a leading role in developing the backbone of the Estonian digital state, the X Roads. Welcome. Thank you. And on the, joining us on the screen, we have Ms. Barbara Ubaldi, the head of digital government and data unit at the OECD. Welcome. Hello. Thank you. Thank you all for, for being with us here today to make the introduction and um, to the topic of a private-public partnership on an international scale. I will ask Barbara, you, to help to set us the theme. Could you please describe the main trends in challenges and priorities of OECD countries that you are currently seeing in the e-governance field? Yeah, thank you very much. First of all, thank you also for having us here. It's a real pleasure on behalf of the OECD. And hi, Lucas. Very uh, hi, nice to e meet you virtually. Uh, Estonia has been, as a member country, a, a leading example on what governments have been doing on digital around the world and happy to keep uh, uh, looking after the priorities that you set for the digital agenda of Estonia. Um, I think the pandemic has clearly demonstrated the key role that governments can play in um, leading the way in taking decisions on the use of digital technologies and data, which are value-based and which somehow are sustainable in the long run. We always uh, uh, think of governments as running behind the private sector. I think that the pandemic imposed on governments um, the, the going online or the transfer online of entire public sectors. Uh, this was unprecedented as an effort that was expected from government. And uh, unprecedented was a level of expectations that some of the speakers in the previous session also mentioned in terms of uh, reactiveness, capacity of governments to respond to the needs of citizens as new um, needs were emerging, but also as uh, uh, core services um, needed to be uh, provided with continuity. So I think that what we saw was that governments that could be uh, capable to use digital tools and data, therefore were more prepared, more digitally mature, to keep providing uh, continuity in the, in the service delivery, were the ones that somehow felt they were more capable to respond to these expectations. Uh, but we also saw that there has been a great acceleration in the adoption of digital tools and in creating environments that enable governments to use data to be able to keep functioning in an agile manner. So what do we see as being the main challenges and priorities for governments at the moment? First of all, the pandemic and the acceleration demonstrated the need for governments to be able to take sound decisions on digital investments, which means being able, for example, to be strategic on how the value proposition on investment is formulated across the administration on how money is spent, so how services and goods are procured in ways that are agile, um, on how the projects are then implemented and results are being monitored. Oftentimes, all these uh, steps are not connected. Therefore, we don't think about digital investment as a chain of decisions, but we see these uh, actions as isolated from each other. The second priority is around skills. So the type of talent and skills that we need to have across all levels of civil service, starting from having the right CIO, the right decision maker with the right profile that needs to have multidisciplinary teams uh, helping him or her out, but also having the right talent and skills across the whole administration. That does not mean only having people who know about data and digital, but people who can, for example, foster the more proactive provision of services, which is based and driven by the needs of users uh, that um, Lucas was also mentioning as part of the priority agenda for uh, Estonia. Third, we need to have the right governance in place. That's a priority. That means not only having the right leaders in place that I just mentioned, but also having the right mechanisms in place that enable people to coordinate, that enable to bring down silos. Um, I will 
quote uh, a colleague from uh, a member country in a leading digital position who said we need to hack bureaucracy. If we really want to achieve the digital transformation, the, we need to be able to coordinate and to cut across a silos. So to conclude, um, as we saw in the Digital Government Index that was launched a couple of years ago and will come up with a new edition in 2022 in the OECD, and based on our Digital Government uh, Framework, what we see is that governments have become more digital by design, uh, they are becoming more open by default, uh, they are focusing on being able to provide tools and guidelines that enable uh, to operate as a platform, but they still need to make efforts to be more data-driven, to be more proactive, and to be more user-driven. Exactly, thank you. Oliver, I'm going to move now completely to the private sector. Um, and can you share from Cybernetica's experience in Estonia and globally as well, building the e-governance solutions, where is your focus today? Uh, is there something holding you back? And what is it? Yeah, thank you. And first of all, um, I would like to kind of uh, reiterate what Barbara said is that I also see that um, the COVID crisis has really um, sped up the digitalization of, um, of governments or societies and there is more and more um, cure is coming into Estonia to Estonian companies to, to help uh, governments digitalize. Um, but in the background of all this I must say that um, no country um, or every country is different. Each country has its own um, challenges up ahead. You cannot take what we have built here in Estonia and copy it in other countries. You can learn from the lessons that we have. That's what I tell to all of my customers or all of our potential customers is we can show you what we have done here in Estonia and we can transform that experience to your local context by changing the technology, adopting the technologies to your culture, to your um, rules and regulations, organizational structures, etc., etc. But when looking at um, why people come to Estonia, why they come to, to Cybernetica, then I think there are kind of three, three main reasons that uh, um, that we are addressed. First of all, when we look at developing countries, they come to Estonia and they are looking for new technologies, new technologies to, to create efficiency, to, to create um, new capabilities uh, to their citizens, to their economies, etc. Um, so we, they are looking for research and development in intensive solutions that bring new, new capabilities or efficiencies. Secondly, what I see uh, people uh, coming to Estonia for is when they look at our society, they look at, okay, how have you achieved that trust in ICT technologies? What is the model behind achieving that trust? And that's a, that's a very, very complicated, um, uh, very, very complicated discussion. And there is usually no good answer to that. There are aspects that they can use, but it's not definitely anything that can be copied one-on-one. -on -one. And the third um, kind of characteristics why, why governments or, or organizations are coming to Estonia is they are actually coming for the developing story. How did Estonia grow so fast? Obviously, you're known as a digital nation. If we digitalize as, as you did, can we, exchange the, can we achieve the same growth? So these are the kind of three I think main drivers um, uh, that organizations, governments come to look at here in Estonia and that we try to um, accommodate into our value proposition. Yeah, the trust topic was really, really important that you mentioned. Hopefully we can come back to it and really find the answers to it and not leave it just pending. And now, Lucas, we are extremely uh, privileged to have you here coming from the private sector to now being the government CIO currently. Please share your unique insight. How easy was it to get the public and private sector stakeholders to sound together uh, in symphony in Estonia? And is partnership with um, government simply business as usual for the companies? Or do you really have to change the mindset to, to collaborate? So, you know, if we go back to the, the early days of e-government in Estonia, it very much was a public-private partnership where, where the design and, and sometimes also the business models around operation were, were built jointly. But I think that, um, you know, 
as technology has evolved, our ability to think about the, the different types of relationships and roles we have between public and private also changes. And I want to talk about two or three technologies that in turn are also driving business model changes. Now one of those is cloud, right? And people think about cloud and they say, oh, that's a, an interesting database technology. But the real business model innovation in cloud is that you actually are able to encapsulate changes to business models, organizational structures into a piece of software. So if I today buy, you know, subscribe to Pipedrive, which is a piece of CRM software. It's not just a bunch of code that I'm getting. I'm also getting the design, the service design, the support to carry out a transformation in how the sales process works in my company or my organization. And government doesn't today, for instance, think about sales processes very much. Um, we've struggled to get people in government to be more customer and client facing. Might be that cloud services that salespeople use brought into government might help that transformation as an example. So cloud not just as a driver of technological, but really as business process change. Second technology is blockchain. Still early days here, um, but uh, blockchain is a way of creating distributed trust and, and information about ongoing processes. So one of the hopes with blockchain is that we can use that and we can use sort of trust technologies more generally to make it possible for government, which ultimately has a task of ensuring an outcome, to achieve that outcome and mandate that outcome without actually having to be involved directly in the service provision. Basically allow government to step back, create markets, um, create layers of encoding digital assets, of supervising goods, products, and services, and, and really be the supervisor and the market organizer instead of itself being responsible for providing the services. And, and there's a third really important, well, I hesitate to call it a technology, but a paradigm change, which is around data, um, which again, creates the information for government to be able to understand how those outcomes have been achieved without always being in the role of providing services itself. And so what we see is that technologies like big data, blockchain, uh, and cloud are also tools that allow us to increase the role of the private sector in actually providing public services or being responsible for them. And, and what, I would like, what I would hope we can talk about in, in the coming decade around public-private partnerships is actually how government can make the private sector responsible for some of the things it does very well. So one of the things that, that all governments have struggled with is user interface. And that's simply because we're monopolists, right? We don't have that fire in our belly to win the next customer um, in a way that competing customer-facing private sector companies do. So how do we bring private sector competition into areas of service provision that have really traditionally been monopolistic areas of government? Um, I won't give, any, give you any easy answers, but I think that those are places where the right deployment of new technologies can help us with that change. Exactly. So let's take the best expertise from, from the public and from the private sector and try to combine them in the best possible way. And Estonia has a successful, pretty successful experience, yes, in, in private uh, public partnership in building the e solutions historically. So I wonder if, if there is a collaboration point also somewhere globally where different stakeholders from the private, private sector and, and public sector can come together. And Barbara, as OECD member countries are committed to identify good practices and coordinate also uh, international policies among of the other collaborative activities. So what importance would you draw on the synchronizing digitalization strategies between countries? Um, this is a very key question. First of all, we really see in the uh, adoption of digitalization strategies um, as a key milestone towards the, the uh, more mature digital government development. Um, a strategy is what, um, as a core element of the government, um, helps the government define the vision, setting the strategic goals, but also helps identify the roadmap to get to the to the results that the government wants to achieve, which, um, like the, the other panelists, I think Oliver was saying, need to be customized to the context of the specific country and in order to make the results uh, sustainable. Now, having said this, because a strategy is very important to steer decision, to align actions to the strategic goals, to coordinate, integrate, find, find synergies, and also to identify um, responses that uh, bring value to the citizens and to the businesses. I think it's a, absolutely a necessity for governments to align strategic goals across borders. I think that there are agendas that within the European Union have emerged as necessary agendas, uh, particularly during the pandemic, around cross-border services, 
around uh, data. Uh, so the um, access and sharing of data with uh, trust clearly across borders needs to be, in my view, a priority, a shared priority of uh, digitalization strategies across borders and digital identity. I think that um, this has been a priority for the Commission for quite a few years, I would say for some decades. This has become a priority for countries around the world outside of the European Union as well. And I think this is essential because it points to a key word that I think is around interoperability interoperability of decision-making processes, interoperability of data, interoperability of systems. And I think this is uh, uh, the big value that can be brought by synchronizing uh, digital uh, strategies or digitalization agendas across borders. I think that the uh, travel certificate uh, that was produced uh, uh, for European citizens has been the biggest demonstration of how if we join up strategic actions and goals across borders, we really can bring the value to the to the citizens and to the users of the services. Yes, exactly. Uh, and I'm going to to take on Oliver's word here before when when he said that a lot of countries are, are coming to to us or to Cybernetica for for consultation. And instead, I'm going to ask this question from Lucas with with this question that many of our viewers are are sending to us. How can Estonia be the international partner for um, for many countries either in Asia or in in Africa or in South America. So is it possible to transfer our advanced digital society to these countries? So I think transfer is the wrong word. Um, there are two thoughts. One is merely a question of, or one is a question of setting ambitions. Um, I think one of the things we encounter very frequently is that you need to actually have the political will and also the more sort of bureaucratic and operational will to carry out transformation. And the role that sort of positive examples play there aren't necessarily one of, of providing you a template to copy one-to-one, -one, but of providing inspiration, uh, providing ideas, and giving you the confidence to know that actually those transformations are possible, you know, that a zero-to-one shift is possible. Um, and beyond that, while I don't think you can copy an entire system lock, stock, and barrel, I think the transfer of individual technologies, products, and services very much is possible. One of the things that's really exciting that's happening in digital government right now is we're going from a world of you know, systems integrators, large custom one-off systems, into, as the private sector has gone through in the last 10, 20 years, much more standardized products and services. Um, so the whole field of GovTech is about bringing the same sort of innovative spirit of startups, but also the consumption models of using cloud-based services, um, having more standardized components into the public sector. So I think one of the things we need to think about as government, is, and this is true in Estonia, but it's also been true for thinking about how things built in Estonia could, could be transferred elsewhere, could also find customers elsewhere. How do we actually consume digital government components and services in a way that doesn't mean that they're unique products that can't be consumed and used elsewhere, but that we actually are specifying you know, via APIs, via standards, the same types of products and services for healthcare in Estonia as healthcare in Uruguay or healthcare in India. Um, that the way in which we think about digital identity and building up the technology stack allows the components that are used here to be used elsewhere and deployed elsewhere. Yeah, I, I see Oliver nodding here a lot. Uh, do you have anything to to add to what uh, Lucas said in terms of of where do you see this international collaboration happening or this cross-border governance happening? Uh, are there any good solutions or do you see hurdles very clearly in the path? I see, first of all, a lot of cooperation in, on the strategic level when governments are developing their uh, e-government strategies or digitalization strategies. Um, there is definitely a lot of um, uh, knowledge exchange between the governments. Uh, it's also been disseminated by OECD, European Commission, and all international, other international organizations. In regards to you know, hardcore uh, joint uh, public service provision, I think what Estonia did with Finland uh, when we um, both uh, uh, decided to share our extra infrastructures was kind of one-off thing in the world. I haven't seen two countries uh, to come together on that level that we actually provide via the same infrastructure, the same services, whether it's in the healthcare domain or, or um, I don't know, business registry, uh, business domains, etc., etc. Now, with, 
what has happened with COVID, and that I come back to the point that Barbara was making, uh, COVID has really pushed the European Commission uh, to develop the digital single market. Uh, first of all, through the COVID pass, um, um, Europe was really surprised that we could create this kind of joint infrastructure, this joint interoperability between uh, COVID certificates and that, that these can be shared across borders, etc. And what I see now, the Commission is really strongly pushing on European-wide digital identity, um, which is a very kind of unique way of looking at digital identity um, based on a wallet infrastructure. Let's see how far the Commission is um, is going with that, infra uh, with that infrastructure, whether it will be able to implement it, but it, it is definitely something that will stand out in the world as, as something that can, is done on, on that large scale with so many countries behind it. But we also see some collaboration aspects also in Africa, uh, where uh, they are working on standardization, uh, on, on data interoperability, providing also cross-border uh, cross services, whether it's for transport, logistics, etc., etc. So I think gradually the world is becoming more and more united in, in bringing these services, but I, I think today um, Europe is in the forefront of these discussions. Well, I see the future of interoperability in very bright colors indeed. Um, when we are considering the cross-border governance, that inevitably includes the interoperable data exchange, and you, Barbara, already briefly touched upon it. Um, the possible benefits of, of uh, interoperability is really easy to predict. The seamless consumption of e-services and the extra benefits gained for, for the end user who is the citizen. Um, but let's, let's discuss the underlying principles of the data exchange. So Barbara, how can you comment from the OECD perspective? What are the essentials um, when dealing with data management and not only to seem transparent, but to actually practice transparency as well. And in the midst of all of this, how we can make the lives better for the citizen instead of just turning it digital? Yeah, thank you. That's, again, another key question, because I think that um, it's not because um, uh, we have data available, it's not because we utilize digital tools that we necessarily bring uh, the value and the trustworthy value to the to the citizens and to the businesses. So if we think about data management from a, a national perspective, and I think that the three of us have underlined the importance of data as a key core element of any digital transformation, I think we need to think about a management that produces results that have an impact on people and produces results in a trustworthy way. Therefore, there are three main set of actions that in our view need to be taken and they need to be seen as part of the same framing of the conversation. First of all, uh, data governance. Data governance that needs to take into account strategic decisions, but also the operational implementation. So on one side, data governance is about having a strategy, a single strategy for the whole uh, public sector adopted by the government, is about having uh, stewards, for example, across the different public sector um, agencies or institutions. So it's not enough to have a single chief data officer, but how do you permeate a culture of data-driven approaches across the whole administration? But it's also about having the right regulations in place that guarantee privacy and security and also accessibility to data across the public sector. And last but not least, it's also about having the right skills of the people that support a more data-driven approach, but also having the guidelines, the standards, to make sure that we have, for instance, interoperability of data, which is also semantic interoperability, and that we all think of data as a key strategic asset and we use data as a key strategic asset across the whole public sector. Uh, the second element is that we need to keep in mind that if data is not used to produce value, then value is not uh, produced for the citizens. So how can we really be very strategic in thinking how data can help us anticipate needs, can help us bring more concrete value through specific services, through specific application, through specific solutions? Now can we best use uh, data to also innovate how we monitor the performance of government? And last but not least, what kind of uh, ethical uh, measures need to be put in place or what kind of framework needs to be put in place to make sure that it, it, data is utilized in an ethical manner? So not only ethical, meaning protecting security and privacy, but we know that the more we use AI, the more we use data, how can we make sure that the choice of data is not leading to biased um, end decisions or to biased policies? 
So it's really very important to make sure the data chosen to also inform AI use is covering needs across the whole society, so produces results that are more inclusive. So we really think that also there is a big space for opening up data that help create partnerships with the civil society, with the private sector, to co-create solutions. But this, this needs to be done in a trustworthy way. And for this to happen, there's also the big importance of setting the framework for securing that, again, for example, consent, um, the consent option is given to citizens in relation to the use that is done about uh, their own data by the different part of the public sector. The transparency means also being more open in terms of sharing information on the use done. Uh, with data that uh, belong to individuals, for example. Very good, Barbara, that you uh, touched on the trust issue because here in the briefing centre, we also get asked a lot, why do we trust our government so much? So do we blindly trust the government or do we trust the government too much? Um, Lucas, from, from Estonia's experience, describe please very br briefly how Estonia has solved the trust question. I don't think we've solved the trust question. Um, I think we've done some things that are helpful with the trust question, and, and we keep on working on the trust question. Uh, one of the things, and we talked about this briefly in the first panel, is that when is it, we're incredibly transparent um, on, well, we're, we're, we're transparent on the technical level, right? And, and, and this is sort of one of the sort of the things we like to talk about around letting people see how their data has been used. Um, that's been something we've done on a limited basis so far, and we're now putting a, a real big effort into making that a universal component of how data is used uh, everywhere in government. Uh, and, and we're making the code available on an open source basis so it can be, be reused by the private sector um, so they can also give users transparency into how their data is being used. And part of that allows us in turn via APIs to open up citizens' own data to be shared with the private sector based on consent so that you can, for instance, reuse your government data in, in, in private services. But there's a different layer of transparency beyond the kind of technological data use transparency that I think is equally, if not more important, and that is organizational and human transparency because the technical systems and the technology we have will fail. Um, it hopefully won't fail frequently if we've done our job well, but it's inevitable that there will be failures. And then the question becomes, how do you react to that failure? What is, your, what, what is the political message, what is the human message to the users of the service that's failed, to the users maybe whose data has been leaked? And there we have generally in Estonia been very transparent when we have failures. And that transparency creates an additional layer of confidence. It's a knowledge that if something does go wrong, I'll know about it. Uh, if something goes wrong, it's going to be worked on really hard um, by the people sort of responsible for that service for them to find a solution. And, and some confidence that the problems that happen are hiccups and they're not sort of disastrous existential challenges either to the system as a whole or in terms of their impact on me as a user. So if we look at some of the well-documented incidents we've had, for instance, the discovery of, of some security vulnerabilities in our identity card some years ago, it was the fact that within 72 hours, the prime minister was talking about this in television and putting forth a plan to solve these problems that I think really didn't necessarily, you know, that we didn't lose the trust in the first place. It kind of gave people the confidence that yes, technology fails, but the underlying human systems are there as a backstop. And I think that's really important that we, we want to avoid the types of big scandals where people find out about data leaks, um, about misuses of their data um, months or years uh, after they've happened. Exactly, and, and granting the, the private companies access to the government data or the citizen data has been really a taboo topic. So, Oliver, what are the privacy technologies right now in place to, to bring the transparency to the surface? I, have, I actually want to start from, uh, from what Luca said. I think actually uh, open communication, transparent company, communication is... Um, is the basis for trust. I mean, if, uh, if Estonia would have um, treated its uh, incidents, uh, for example, the incident that we had with our ID card, a little bit different, then I think we would have lost a lot of trust in digital um, technologies uh, in our society. Uh, second point that I want to make is that in regards to trust, I think a lot of the mindset changes uh, when we start to think about data uh, in a way that who owns that data. If I give my medical records to a hospital, I actually should be the owner of this data and I give uh, 
this data to the hospital. And the hospital should actually treat that data as, um, as something that is given to them that they need to guard and that I would have the tools to control. If, if this kind of framework is in place, then we create a lot of, actually, uh, let's say, a lot of the premises for, uh, for talking about trust and, and how to control data. I think a lot of the governments um, that I have seen or a lot of the discussions are still in a way that, okay, if I get your data, I, I own that data. Uh, it's either a company or a government, and in, in, this kind of, in this kind of context, the privacy aspects or the, the, the control of the data is, is really lost in the conversation. So we need to turn that around. And I'm, I'm, I'm really happy that we had this uh, extensive discussion in the commission and, the, and people are, are really being educated that they are, they are the owners of the data and it is being really taken into into, into considerations in the law. This is something that we've done in Estonia since the beginning. Um, of course, we can do better the enforcement. Like uh, Luca said, now we are building a universal consent management uh, platform in Estonia. But, but this, is, this, I think, changes the, the nature of the discussion. In regards to privacy preserving technologies, I mean, this is something that Cybernetica has worked on for the last 10 years. And, and it, what it basically means is how you, um, how you make queries on confidential data in a way that you don't reveal the individual source, so how you can utilize the data. And I think that actually the world is just you know, getting ready for these technologies, but these are definitely not in the mainstream, not, uh, not something that are used in daily lives, but governments, more progressive governments, uh, more advanced, uh, with more advanced capabilities are trying are already um, trying to deploy these technologies and are, are these are getting more and more commercially used but I think they will become more pervasive in the next 10 years where we where we have fundamentally privacy preserving technologies yes a very passionate topic the the trust and and privacy topic of course and now to wrap up I would, we have a question from the audience and I, I can think that i think that we can incorporate this into to you to the final question as well so um, let's give the audience a very concrete takeaway so of what to expect from the future and deriving from the ongoing warfare including the cyber attacks uh, let's not go into politics but uh, treat the situation as ground zero for the e-governance build-up. So I would ask each one of you to just give one simple word um, of what would your suggestion be to how to develop next generation digital governance to manage crises and unplanned events. Barbara, can we start with you? Yeah, two things. On one side, uh, we need to put at the core words such as trust and people so that digital becomes a way to strengthen our democratic systems. And second, we need to focus on agility and sustainability because we need to make sure that all our decision-making processes and systems are less vulnerable um, in uh, unprecedented uh, emergency situations. Thank you. Lucas. Well, I, I'll get political. Um, I would say that, uh, that Ukraine has really been working over the last couple of dec uh, decades, years, sorry, uh, in a real digital transformation of their government. And it's not a sort of standalone process aside from the political transformation of the country. It goes hand in hand with their efforts to make the country more accountable, more democratic, more, more open to citizens. Um, and, uh, and first of all, I mean, let's not talk, you know, Ukraine is going to win this war. Um, strategically, they're going to win this war. I think the tragedy is going to be that, it, that there are going to be many more losses before they do. But when that happens, we're going to need to help Ukraine flourish and rebuild, both Ukrainians in Ukraine and the millions of Ukrainians who are currently outside of the borders of Ukraine. Um, and I think that the infrastructure that Ukraine already has around digital government is going to help them do that. It's going to help them come back faster, be more resilient. Uh, we're seeing today that the digitization that they have done means that uh, Ukrainians, both in Ukraine and abroad, have digital identity, which allows the government to give them support and services, services even when the physical situation is, frankly, you know, literally under, under, the, uh, under bombing attack on a daily basis. Um, 
And one of the things that we also see is, is the more modern infrastructure is, the more resilient it is, uh, the more easy it is to, um, to create, uh, uh, well, Today, I think the Ukrainian government announced that they're looking to um, have backups uh, of, of uh, government data outside of Ukraine. Um, so again, that's one of the things where the more you virtualize your infrastructure, the more it's based on modern cloud technologies, the easier it is to move it and to do that. Um, so I think that we actually see a case here where, where the sort of uh, some of the boring technical things that we talk about in the, in the context of digital government are actually being put to the test. And having gotten those things right, uh, makes your system more resilient in a way that has a very direct bearing and impact on on people in a very difficult situation. Now, I'd say um, nothing would help Ukraine as much as the war ending, but beyond that, I think that once it ends, uh, and, and as Ukrainians deal with the consequences right now, and the, or deal with the really the terrible situation they face, having these infrastructures and these services in place will help them. Oliver, you really have a couple of words only left. It's really hard to add anything to what Luca said, uh, but I will I will say just a couple of words. Um, first of all, political or not, uh, Cybernetica has worked with uh, uh, with the government of Ukraine and with our good partners, e Governance Academy, for the last five years to help them build a resilient e government infrastructure. And a um, couple of words: resilient. Uh, how to design your systems in a way that if one node goes down, there is still another node or another nodes that can um, can keep operating. And of course, secondly, security. How to build systems in a way that uh, they cannot be penetrated, that they cannot be hacked. Thank, Thank you so much, all of you, for being a part of this panel and sharing your wonderful insights. Thank you so much for attending.